Facing cancer doesn't mean you are now only the cancer patient. So often we hear those with cancer share the need to feel seen, to feel understood, and not feel alone. So whether you are facing cancer yourself or supporting someone who is, join us. My name is Susan Larkin. We are Facing Cancer Together. In our previous episode, radio broadcaster Maureen Holloway and television journalist Wendy Mesley, who have their own podcast called Women of Ill Repute, took over the mics to talk about their cancer experience. Let's pick up the conversation where we left off. Wendy, you were talking earlier about working through cancer, you both did, and um, when people would, you know, oh, she looks she looks like she has cancer. When you're done treatment and everyone now thinks you're better, you're a survivor, it's all done, but you're still feeling the impact, whether it's the emotional impact or impact from the drugs, brain fog, chemo brain, some of it's similar to menopause. How do you work through that in an environment that is so go, go, go? Well, that's what I loved about it. And I think that's what Maureen was talking about too, is the the go, go, go was was the part that that I I loved. Um, it was very unusual. Um, and I have, as all TV people do, I have a very large head. So, no, <laughs> so, so none of the, uh, none of the wigs fit me. So I had to like cut around and, and I had one that sort of worked on TV that I could wear for, uh, an hour and then take off. And I had another one that, uh, but it was, it was very, very strange because it takes a long time for, uh, well, your body never returns to normal, but uh, it takes a long time just for the hair to grow back. And so I had false eyelashes and there was one uh, makeup artist, because uh, guess what? People who anchor the news don't wear makeup. Oh my God, they do. Um, but she had a, a, a problem with, um, she had shaky hands. <laughs> so <laughs> imagine putting on eyelashes with, <laughs> with shaky hands. So I would go, I would be like, oh my God, it's, it is the time of high definition television with, with one eyelash, like mm. up around my eyebrow, which didn't exist, was penciled in, but it's easier to pencil it. So it was just, uh, but I was just like, screw it. Like I, w- it was seen as revolutionary when I was pregnant, uh, 20, you know, 25 years ago to appear with a big belly on TV, to talk about breasts, to talk about menopause, to talk about cancer, any of that stuff. Like now, I think people are a little bit cooler with all of that stuff. But back then it was just like, screw it, this is wrong. Like, why should I be ashamed of, of, of having cancer, of being the age that I am, of having boobs? I mean, look at, let's, let's get real. So I was just, uh, I was really happy to be at the office and anyone who had a problem with it, that was their problem. I, I got an email from someone saying, oh, Wendy, uh, I'm, I'm really missing the long hair. Like, and she had no idea. Uh, uh, I'm really missing the long hair. And that's short. It's like, it's just too short. It's too short. Like, it's yeah. too sh- so I put it up on my wall and I laughed at it. Yeah. But you know, television people, and I've done enough television to know that as well, is that you, your your appearance, whether you have cancer or not, is constantly apparently a valid source for discussion amongst everybody. Hair and, and teeth. And, hair and hair, teeth. Yeah, hair and teeth. You're, yeah, your teeth are too big. Your hair is too short. Uh, your head is too big. I was, well, I'll oh, do no, it you're again. supposed to have a big head. You have to have a big head. <laughs> you have to have a big head. But yeah, your appearance is uh, is uh, grist for the for the mill. And what about some of those symptoms that people don't see? People see the hair loss, they see the physical changes, but they don't necessarily, they can't see what's going on inside. No. Um, the, you know, maybe lack, uh, maybe the drugs are making it more difficult to concentrate or to focus or, or a bit of memory loss or brain fog or whatever it might be. How do you manage that? Well, I, I like to blame all of my memory issues on, uh, on chemo because obviously there couldn't be any other reason. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was telling Maureen that during chemo, I got this kind of strange 
uh, malady, which maybe I made up, but uh, but it seemed extremely real at the time, was I couldn't find any like cliche phrases. Like even now, like I, I tried to explain it to Maureen. She goes like so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. And I'm like, yep. Yep, yep. Like a penny saved is a penny earned or you know, just adages. Just yeah, like, like yeah. in journalism, you're taught never to use any of those. Like if you hear a cliche, let, let alone a phrased cliche, uh, you should never use that. But I I don't know. I, 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 found it, uh, I found it very, very difficult. But I've always had a crappy memory anyway. So it just made everything much, much worse. And there was something I could like blame everything on the chemo. But uh, but Maureen's got a much better memory than well, me. Well, you know, for the time being, we'll see. Um, but uh, I'm I've always been prone to anxiety um, and depression. They go arm in arm, but more anxiety and uh, and then along comes something to be really anxious about. <laughs> you know, my life might be ending, and so that was very hard to cope with. And I was taking. Um, I was taking. Well, they give you meds, right? Just when you're going through chem- chemo, they give you a bag full of Ativan. Um, and, uh, not that I even asked for it, but the, the reason I should explain for anybody who's going through this is that I thought it was fine when I started chemo, the, the, uh, the chemo, uh, nurses at Princess Margaret, and I'm sure elsewhere are amazing because that's what they do. And they know how to make it easier, as easy as possible for you. And I was all set to start chemo, excited even. I was like, let's get going. And uh, I went in and uh, John was with me and we had two nurses and they uh, they took me into a private room. They don't normally do that, but when you're first one, you're, you're, you're given privacy. And uh, they set me up and they started the pump and I projectile vomited across the room. I had no idea. I had no idea that's how I was going to react. And, but that's, your, that's your, your mind. That wasn't a physical reaction to it. Wow. And so right away, they were like, okay, well, we need to get on with this. We're going to give you uh, Ativan. Um, or maybe they gave me something a little stronger, but we're going to to tranquil. We're going to give you something to calm you down so that you can take this. And after that, it was fine. Um, but yeah, there these are the things that you go through. And I, and I did become somewhat reliant on sleeping pills mm. uh, and um, during the process. And, uh, and then a year later, after I'd finished treatment, it actually got worse because once you stop, and you'll find this out if you're going through treatment yourself, once you stop treatment, there is this fear that I'm no longer fighting it. You know, the word we use is fighting cancer, although cancer isn't a warrior. Um, once you're no longer fighting it, then it's going to come back. And sometimes it does. But the, I think everyone I know has been through it. As soon as they stop treatment, they're, they go through this, holy shit. Now I'm alone again, and I don't have the I don't have the the arsenal anymore, uh, and that's really tough to go through. And if you have been taking anti-anxiety meds, you may want to continue them because I did um, less and less so. Now I still do, uh, but that was a really you're asking uh, Sue about the internal is the fear and the anxiety. It's a it's a very scary time. Um, yeah. A lot of people, you know, go to group or they get they see it there. I didn't, but. You know, avail yourself of anything and anybody that you can because you don't deserve this and you deserve all the support you can find, whether it be chemical or 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 physical or emotional. You deserve all the support you can avail yourself of. I was told that I had an 80% chance of survival. If I'd been told that we have no, like Maureen, like we have no diagnosis. I, they never told me. I looked it up. Don't do that, by the way. Well, yeah, don't. Oh, well, it's easy to say don't, don't look Google. at Dr. Google. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I did. I went home and Googled well, after my, and I was like, there is a 2% chance of survival, which, and I didn't even know what I was looking at. So I do want to pass that on. Do not, no matter how much you can avail yourself of how much information is available to you, you're not, unless you're a doctor yourself, you're really not in a position to interpret it. And it changes all the time. Yeah, and, and then all the naturopath people are are in there saying, uh, "Take oh vitamin C, and that'll cure everything." Okay. You don't do the chemo because big pharma. And I'm like open. I'm a journalist. I'm open to all kinds of conspiracy yeah. theories. Or are they just theories? Are they bullshit? Are they real? Are yeah. they whatever? So you explore. But I, uh, somebody that I knew through a uh, through uh, windsurfing and surfing and whatever that I do. Um, decided that, no, I've got a perfect body. I've been diagnosed with breast cancer, but I've got a perfect body. I'm just going to eat all the right foods and that's, I'm going to cure myself and she's dead. Yeah. So, uh, I just learned to, as what did you call it? The main poison and slash or what? Uh, slash poison and burn. 
Yeah. So I just gave myself <laughs> up to that. And because uh, I'm not sure what other options that I, I think there are uh, different approaches these days with uh, uh, immune approaches, but uh, um, but I would not recommend taking uh, vitamin C to cure your cancer. But take vitamin C, <laughs> you know. Yes. yes. <laughs> but no, that is another thing that happened to me early on when I went in for the mastectomy. A, f- a friend, a close friend, a man who'd always been very, um, uh, uh, very holistically oriented, like to the point of borderline, I don't know. Uh, he actually called me up the night before I was going in for surgery and told me not to do it. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, this is, don't you, it's a conspiracy. And yeah, he was far gone. So uh, uh, all right, this is the last thing I need to hear. The last thing I need to hear right now. You know, we're going through trauma as a family. I do not need to hear this. Went into the hospital, spent a few days there, came home and there were, there were flowers everywhere and people knocking on the door. It was actually really, really sweet and a huge outpouring of support. And, uh, and, my brother came from Germany and uh, was making dinner for everybody who happened to drop by. And it was like, there was a festive atmosphere. And then this dude, holistic guy shows up. He hadn't been invited with a stack of literature. Hmm. And to the point where my husband and my brother took him outside and said, listen, man, this not is, needed. Uh, Thanks. This is mm. not, and I've never seen him again. I've not, he's called, hmm. he's emailed the whole bit, but yeah, be, I mean, well-intentioned. But, you know, the medical, Western medical uh, complex, such as that they, they have, they get cancer too. They have wives and children and parents who get sick. There's no conspiracy. Everybody wants us to get better if we, and we've made tremendous strides. And yeah, maybe willow bark will make you feel better, but there's no reason to think it's going to cure you. And that probably happens a little bit to everybody who gets diagnosed. Some well-meaning person says, if you eat a plant-based diet, I had a young woman tell me that had I eaten the plant-based diet, none of this would have happened to me. Well, now you know. Well, now I know. Thank you, Missy. (laughs) Yeah, I was uh, was at Marketplace when this happened and uh, when I got diagnosed. And uh, so they were all, oh, host with cancer, host with, I'm being a little bit facetious, but uh, they were like, why don't you, you, you're coming back to work in bits and pieces. So why don't you do uh, something on, on having cancer? And I was like, I don't know. I'm a like Maureen. I am a woman of ill repute, and I'm very proud to make jokes that some may see as inappropriate, some may see as as welcome. Um, but I just wasn't interested in doing the boohoo. I'm so sorry. I'm you know I'm why me uh, thing. It was more the, and so I decided. Well, I what I am is a journalist, so I'm going to look into it. And I looked into well the first time I went to Princess Margaret Hospital for my chemotherapy or my surgery surgery was the first sort of reveal as a journalist was like, there are all of these people. It is so common. Uh, like every, like almost 50% of people are going to get some kind of cancer in their life if they live beyond 40 or 50. And uh, which most people do. Uh, most people do not die of cancer these days. Some unfortunately still do. Um, But anyway, I ended up doing an investigative piece, which was about why are we doing more on prevention? Like everything causes cancer. And why, why aren't we fighting this instead of just saying, oh, well, everything causes cancer. So let's just uh, hurrah. So uh, anyway, it was a it was quite a an interesting uh, dive into journalism. Um, And I know that there are some poisons like wine that I do not want to give up. That was the most horrifying thing. That's a lie. That's a complete lie. (laughs) (laughs) Have another glass. Um, I remember Dr. McCready saying to me too, this was about going on, uh, I I have, I take a tiny little bit of uh, estrogen because I can, although it's still contraindicated, even if the breast cancer you had was not hormonally tagged. But I remember McCready, Dr. McCready saying to me, it's a balance. You know, you have to decide. I mean, if we felt that it was a real concern, we would caution. But in your case, there's no more reason for you not to take it or very or only a very slight. Like in, in, what I guess I'm trying to say, passing on his message is be in, get informed and then make a decision based on that. Yeah, well, that was basically the thrust of the of the story was at least let me know. Like, mm-hmm. and now everybody knows about wine and we all make jokes about it if we still drink wine. But a lot of people um, have chosen not to. They, I've, I gave up cigarettes a thousand years ago. There's just a bunch of things that you know are stupid uh, and that you can avoid. And so I just like, we're adults, let us know. So that anyway, I ended up doing that story. But uh, 
but I think people still expected, uh, back to the theme that uh, Maureen was talking about at the beginning, they still expected me to go, oh, I'm just so grateful. Yeah, I'm grateful. Alive. That conversation <laughs> we had with Jeannie uh, Becker, uh, she's mm-hmm. more on the grateful side, you know, and I think there is when you come through something, like even when you come out of a car accident, you're grateful to be alive. Yeah. Um, and I think she's still in that phase, that phase that, you know, oh my God, I've had the worst scare of my life and now apparently I'm going to be okay. So yeah, gratitude is a natural uh, reaction and there's no reason why you shouldn't feel that. Shame is completely unnecessary. There is no need for shame, uh, no matter what. Uh, but both Wendy and I sort of came out of it with a more of a Wendy, cause she's got an investigative nature with more pissed off. And I was, I was resentful. It's like this mm-hmm. took out, this took me out of my life for two years, at least maybe more. Cause I had went through reconstruction, which was a long and arduous process. Um, but I've never felt, of course I'm grateful to be alive, but I never thought I deserved to get it in the first place. So that's my, my attitude is, and even though I've done, you know, fundraisers and I've done the ride to conquer cancer and, and gotten involved with Princess Margaret on various fundraising, but only to a point. I was asked a lot after, uh, even during treatment, will you come and be host my barbecue for breast cancer? Uh, and I'd say no. And then people go, well, why not? You're a survivor. And I was like, yeah, well, that's, I'm going to survive and do the things that are matter to me and good luck. I mean, it's great that you're doing that, but I don't owe anybody anything. Yeah, I don't give money survivor. to, well, not anybody, but almost anybody who does, uh, who does the run uh, or does whatever to the raise ride, money. Yeah, yeah and I'm like, better you than me. I did two of them. And that's enough. I, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, it was uh, at some point as a, as a famous person with cancer, um, you get asked to do a lot of things and, and, um, at, at some point you have to get on with your life. So you have to be supportive, but you also like, I, I at some point I decided I didn't want to be cancer girl. So here I am. <laughs> talking to you about yeah, thank cancer. You. <laughs> Thanks cancer. Well, I mean, with some, ex- well, the, the purpose of this is to speak plainly. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's, uh, You know, you are both incredibly uh, successful and accomplished and amazing women. It doesn't define you. Like at some point, that 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 was something I wanted to make clear is that you know I I don't mention it in my biography. Um, Oh, I think I do. It's like it's, it's, it's not the lead. Advocate. It's buried. Uh, it's yeah, the yeah, buried it's a, lead. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I think I'm an advocate for women's wellness or some such thing. Of course I am, but uh, no, it shouldn't define. That's exactly what it. Uh, you have to say it does not define you. Unless of course it does. Yeah, I I just wish that uh, that Maureen and I, the two women of ill repute, had uh, had managed to speak to each other because there was someone who I barely knew who worked at CBC and she was in charge of communications. Uh, Ruth Ellen Souls, who had been through it. Uh, she's a, a few years older. She's now retired um, and doing improv, actually. So there, yeah. Um, but she used to call me every day and talk about, you know, well, this weird thing's going to happen. And then this, yeah. this weird. And it was just, it was like, I could talk to my husband about, well, this weird thing is happening, but it wasn't the same. Talking to somebody no. who has uh, has gone through it um, was, was really, was really helpful. And Maureen and I still talk about it. We, yeah, uh, every well, it couple of weeks up, it comes up, right. Yeah. It comes up when in, in, in our uh, podcast, uh, I do want, I may mention this off the end, but when I, when I, uh, was diagnosed, there was a book called Epl- Uplift, which is a compilation of stories from women. Oh, and some men, uh, let's not forget that of, of how they dealt with the daily, challenges. And a lot of the stories are very funny and uh, a lot of them are quite moving and it has nothing to do with survival and it's not a medical thing. And it's been updated, but it's called Uplift. Uh, and I've given almost everybody that I know who's asked me about it, I've suggested that they read it because I read it while I was in the hospital. And it was all like, you know, what to do with when you only have one breast. And <laughs> By the way, when you only have one breast and you get reconstruction, which one is the good one? <laughs> That's I'm just asking, throwing it out. Which one depends who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> but the book is called Uplift, and uh, and and it is it it gave me hope. It made me it it kind of provided the same kind of resources that that uh, that we're trying to do right here, Sue. So I would yeah. recommend that. I um I 
I had uh, two lumpectomies, one big, one small, and they were on the lower half, thank God. So I, you know, I can still fake it from above, shall we say. Um, <laughs> what, about the, what about the crop tops? Can't do that, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Can't do the bottoms, no. Um, but a friend of mine had uh, breast cancer and decided to go for the... Uh, and, and, the, the the prelude to all of this is that I was thinking, why don't I just get them chopped off so I don't have to go through oh, the, yeah. the, yeah. Uh, the 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 fear uh, mammogram too. every year and the go you know the fear of it returning. Um, but as years go by, I'm glad that I didn't. Particularly as a, this friend of mine diagnosed with breast cancer, decided I'm just going to get them off. Yeah, and I'm going to figure out what to do. And uh, I'm going to get a tummy tuck at the same time and get the fat from my tummy put into my boobs up top and everything will be great. Uh, and two or three years later, she's still like dealing with issues from yeah. surgery. So I don't think that there's any easy answer. So if someone now asks me, should I get them chopped off or should I rebuild them or should I just uh, go through the radiation? Because radiation has uh, profound effects as well, uh, long term and short term. Um, what I don't do think say? that there's any right answer. There is no right answer. I'm still trying to have, <laughs> this so ridiculous. I'm still to have, I'm still trying to have the other breast removed. I may have to do it myself. Um, <laughs> chop, but, chop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, because well. there's nothing wrong with it, but, uh, I get, I, it's still an area of concern because I, it's a long story, but, uh, and I actually had my, my, uh, gynecologist say, you know, if you can advocate for that, but you know, when the medical establishment probably rightfully does not like to to lop off any healthy tissue, but I do worry about that. And I hate being uneven. And and I had it took me three reconstructions to get this one going um, because of the radiation. And so I ended up having to have I'd had a tummy tuck before um, I was diagnosed with cancer, so I didn't I didn't get to do what your friend did, Wendy, to move move everything up. So they had to take a, a, a muscle and flesh from my back and it just took forever to do it. And I look back on that now and it was almost worse than the cancer itself because it, it, and I had the best, Dr. John Semple at Women's College, absolute artist. He is an artist actually. Um, and so it certainly wasn't his fault. It was just that I was so desperate to look normal again. And now 15 years later, I'm thinking really who looks normal? Um, you and know, we looked pretty hot in our pink wigs. Sure did. <laughs> I did have I did have a long blonde wig while I was going through chemo, and I had a prosthetic bra, so I had huge boobs like torpedo tits, and this long blonde <laughs> wig. And I've told you this story, Wendy. And I'm walking along one day, and I'm getting catcalled, and I'm thinking, Jesus, if I lopped off this, if I pulled off the wig and lift up my shirt, you would be horrified. <laughs> But such is such is the world, you know. We tend to judge people very extraneously. Oh, that's funny. You both have mentioned, you know, getting phone calls, getting a note from a friend saying, "My friend's been diagnosed. I've been diagnosed." Even you know, twenty years later, people are reaching out for your insights, your support, your your words of wisdom. Obviously, you know, off the top, you were asking. You know, you said first question is, "What camp are you in?" What are what are some of those other I don't like saying advice that doesn't seem like the right word but what what are those things that you tell people when they reach out I well I think the camp thing is the most important because if you think you're going to die it's a completely different world than if you think you're going to live so it's uh it's I, I and I can't even imagine I don't have any answers for that maybe Maureen does but the one piece of advice that I haven't talked about that made a huge difference to me was uh, I just, at the beginning, when I was first going through chemo, the first week or so, I just wanted to hole up and I didn't want to have to deal with it because being a public person, uh, I mean, our house, when it was first announced, because I, I announced it on CBC and I was interviewed on radio and whatever. Um, uh, and so, I mean, our house looked like a it looks like a, it looked like a florist. So it was just, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and then all of these people, all of these letters, um, all of these emails, all of these people sent me videos, people. And I just, I, I just didn't have time to respond to everything. And so I appointed two people. So I appointed my husband for family and, and really close friends. And I invited Anna Maria Tremonti, who is a, an old CBC pal. We worked together on the Hill back in uh, the 80s uh, to handle 
the communication with others. So I would tell her and I would tell him, today's treatment, blah, 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 I'm doing fine or I'm not doing fine or leave me alone or <laughs> reach out. Or They were sort of emissaries for me. And so that made that made a huge difference where I felt like when I was too exhausted to reach out to or too downspirited, I'm not even sure that's a word, um, to reach out to people that somebody else would would do that and and I think it helped them too to feel to feel close mm. so what about any <clears throat> other kid, Marie? well <clears throat> I'm just looking at the background you can't see this if you're listening but there's there are three pictures behind me which I don't normally have behind me when I'm working but this is a personal thing and these were taken a week after uh the mastectomy wow yeah I still had tubes um so the one there is my husband and me, and then there's the four of us, and down at the end are my kids. Oh. I know, I know. I didn't know that was the timing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no makeup. And our, our, we have a photographer who's a, a a good friend, and he said, just come, just wear black t-shirts. Don't worry about I'll figure it out. And, uh, and you took got these shots. That was before I started yeah. chemo, right? So what I didn't realize, and I don't want anybody to get freak out about this, what I didn't realize was the massive impact it had on my kids. Yeah. Uh, we told them I was going to be okay, even though, but they know when you say we're going to be okay. And then they found out, they did find out later, you didn't know you were going to be okay. And I was like, well, what, what, what were we going to tell you? You were 12 and six. But anyway, they, uh, they were fine while I went through treatment. It was a year later, my eldest especially was slammed into profound anxiety, which is not easy being 12, 13. And, and he started a new school and his grandfather died the same year that I, the first loss, uh, the same year I was in tra treatment. We actually, uh, had a, a grief counselor working with them for a while. Um, uh, I don't know how much good she did. She didn't do any harm. Let's put it that way. But, um, we had to, uh, Aiden, who's 30, is not going to help me, uh, thank me for saying this, <laughs> but we had them take their beds into our, we circled the wagons. So basically they slept and we all slept in the same room uh, for about a year afterwards hmm. um, because we all had to be together. And I mean, I wish, I, that's, the, that's the thing that I wish, that I regret the most, not that I could do anything about it, but that's... The, the profound impact it had on my kids and their well-being um, is something I, I, I would change, obviously, if I could. That's far worse than losing your hair, far yeah. worse than having a breast removed, far worse than even the fear of dying. It's scarier to worry about somebody else than to worry about yourself, in, in my case anyway, in a lot of people's cases. Yeah, so I just, tried to go through it with uh, denial, uh, yeah. which sort of worked for me, but it uh, didn't necessarily work for my husband. Uh, and my child, I remember, uh, after first getting the diagnosis, went to see the, uh, the pediatrician cause Kate was six and, uh, what do we tell her? And, uh, the pediatrician, uh, who was great, uh, said, well, just tell her you're, you're going to live until you know you're going to die. Just yeah. tell her, just tell her you're going to live. And, and I was thinking that, well, it can't be that huge a deal because her for she was in first grade, I guess. So her first grade teacher and her kindergarten teacher uh, w had both been through uh, cancer. One was off for a year. Someone, uh, the uh, person across the street had cancer and had survived. The person on the other side of the house was uh, a nurse who dealt with. So it was like breast ca cancer is like every, which it kind of is. But I was hoping that it wouldn't be that big a deal. But I remember the school calling me the day that uh, uh, somebody else who had cancer uh, somebody else's mom, uh, Kate's, one of Kate's classmates had died and they called to, uh, let me know, um, uh, before Kate found out cause they were going to tell the whole, uh, class, the whole school. Ugh. Um, yeah. So it was, so yeah. So I, 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 I tried to uh, deal with denial, but as he <laughs> says, it's uh, not entirely effective. Yeah. Anyway, just know that if you have a family that loves you, well, that that's first of all wonderful. Yeah. But they're going to suffer too, and 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 acknowledge that. Yeah. You know, um, I'm not saying that what we did, you know, but bringing everybody's beds into my room was the right thing to do. But it's it, you do what you have to do, right? Yeah. And that there's so many people. What I'm hearing too is that there are so many people also there to help your loved ones. Yes. 
And again, I think I keep saying the word avail a lot. Avail yourself of all the resources. Listen to this podcast. Yeah. Get, get uplift. Join these groups. Talk to somebody who's had cancer. Now, do be prepared that you may call up a friend who had cancer and they may not want to talk about it because they're dealing with it their own way. But, you know, it's so common. It is so common and it affects everybody. Yeah, uh, no, that, that's, that's a very important point, actually, because a number of people, my friend Neil McDonald, who I worked with in Ottawa, his his brother, Norm, the comedian, uh, didn't tell people. I mean, obviously, yeah, people were really close, but yeah. that was his choice, right? Yeah. He just uh, decided, I'm not going to tell other people that yeah. I'm... Uh, that I have a cancer that's probably going to kill me. Yeah. So, so I mean, every and choice I respect is right. that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever blows your skirt up. <laughs> yeah. Or your crop top. Just, or your, your crop, crop top. top. <laughs> no crop tops, please. No crop tops. Oh, uh, Maureen, Wendy, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I just thank you so much for being so open and um, blunt. I think is probably in a in a in a supportive and lovely way um about what you've been through and and what that experience was like but also that you know 18 years later here you are women of ill repute having wow. still continuing to have these amazing conversations thank you well thank you for having us sue it's really nice to be on this end of it and it's been a bit of an emotional experience but hey like it's let's share it yeah, yeah it uh, was a long time ago that we both went through it, but it's still extremely vivid. And uh, yeah, we started to travel. We started to screw screw the mortgage payments. Let's just travel. Um, and so now they're poor and, and without home. <laughs> <laughs> all I've got is this room and we, we sleep and eat and pee all in this room. <laughs> Wendy brought her bed into your room now. No, but she's too. welcome to okay. any time. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Yeah, it's been lovely talking to you. So, yeah. Nice, nice to share the stories, but even nicer to be alive. So, thanks. So, here I am being grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still angry. <laughs> Thank you. It's not just public figures like Wendy and Maureen who are willing to share so openly. Next episode, you'll hear from three incredible guests talking to us very openly from very different stages of their cancer experience. Please share the Facing Cancer Together podcast with anyone in your life facing a cancer diagnosis or caring for someone who is. And if you're interested in learning more about Look Good, Feel Better and our workshops, visit us at lgfb.ca. This is Story Studio Network.